Good morning. My name is Leo Grork. I consider myself very lucky to be the eighth president and vice chancellor of Trent University. I want to begin today by acknowledging that we are located in the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe Mississauga, adjacent to the Haudenosaunee territory in southern Ontario. Thank you for joining us today, and welcome to our graduates, their parents, families, spouses, partners, and friends. I know that some of you have come from close by, and some of you, particularly our guests today, have come from afar. I did want to begin by uh, noting some special guests who are with us today. Uh, first, the chair of the Board of Governors of Trent University, Rod Taylor. I think applause would be suitable, Rod. <laughs> I wanted to welcome the faculty from Fleming College who are here uh, to celebrate the graduates of the ecological restoration joint program that we run with Fleming College. And last but not least, I wanted to give a special welcome to our friends from Curve Lake First Nation. And there's a bit of a story here. I just would like you to know the background. Uh, today we will be honoring somebody from Curve Lake. Of course, we're honoring them because of their personal accomplishments, not because of where they come from. But it is a special pleasure to honor someone who comes from Curve Lake because Trent University and Curve Lake have a long background that really begins with the founding of the university 50 years ago. And just to give you a flavor of that, I'd like to quote, uh, this is from a speech that Chief Phyllis Will, uh, Williams gave uh, in 2014 at the celebration of Trent's 50th university. She says, Curve Lake has a long, a long standing relationship with Trent University, which began with $2 and mutual respect. Curve Lake Chief Dalton Jacobs, some 50 years ago, contributed the first $2 to kick off fundraising for a new university, which was within what was then known as Trent Valley. A unique relationship has been formed one that is still evident today. This relationship was founded on respect and honor, and today still continues with many projects and events. May this special bond be honored as long as the wind shall blow. And I think today's convocation uh, with our honorary degree recipient will take that relationship with Curve Lake even uh, further. Uh, to our visitors, I wanna say that I hope you will enjoy Trent this wonderful campus, take some time to look around it. Uh, there are lots of canoes and kayaks around if you want to trout the river, but uh, the university lawyers have asked me to say that please don't do that if you haven't been canoeing and kayaking before. <laughs> now, I did want to say something about the sense of community and about this ceremony. Of course, this ceremony has a serious aspect. Uh, the graduates today have completed all the requirements for their degrees, uh, but this is Trent, and at Trent we're formal, but we're informal too. So I wanted to remind you that the ceremony is supposed to be fun, okay? Uh, don't be shy, make noise. To the parents, I, I wanna say feel free to embarrass your sons and daughters as they come across. Okay, and uh, this is a, an academic event, so uh, for those of you who are not in university, uh, whenever you say something at an academic event, you have to justify it with references and a bibliography. <laughs> so I went and I got some references uh, about the Harvard, history of Harvard uh, convocations. I would just note, Samuel Batchelor noted in his bits of Harvard history that our forefathers closely associated the thirst for learning with the thirst for beer. <laughs> Research by Harvard archivist Marvin Hightower found that comp the comparatively few graduates of 1703, in 1703 there were about 20 graduates from Harvard, they and their guests consumed 14 barrels of beer, 18 gallons of wine, 
and a barrel of cider. Hightower also notes that in 1797, a live elephant was brought from Providence, Rhode Island, to be exhibit, exhibited at convocation, along with people dressed as mermaids and mummies and displays of two-headed calves. The locals were invited to compete with Harvard scholars in prize competitions of target shooting. I'm sorry, we don't have any elephants, okay? And we don't have any mermaids, but we're here to have fun, and we like you to infuse that uh, into the convocation. Maybe a round of applause for all the fun we're going to have. <laughs> Now, that being said, I'm going to get a little serious for just a moment. Today, we celebrate convocation. This is the most important event in the university calendar. This is a time when we celebrate the accomplishments of our graduates, the contributions and support of their family and friends, and the pivotal role played by our faculty and staff in guiding them to this moment. This year, we celebrate a special convocation milestone this being Trent's 50th convocation. As of this year, Trent has enjoyed 50 years of welcoming and honoring our new alumni. As we celebrate Trent's 50th convocation, it is interesting that Canada celebrates its 150th anniversary. Trent has been a key force in the development of Ontario and Canada over the last 50 years. Over the next 50 years, as Canada approaches its 200th birthday, Trent plans to be a significant catalyst for its further development. I want to tell all the graduates that uh, I'm expecting them all to come back to celebrate for our 100th convocation. That's 50 years from now. Uh, I won't be there, uh, but I expect all of you to be. At each of our convocation uh, ceremonies, I try to share a few stories that can help our visitors understand Trent and who we are and what we are a little bit better. Today, I'd like to draw your attention to three highlights. The first is a campus development, our new student center, which is going up just behind the Battle Library. And I invite you to walk past it, especially on the riverside, it's going to be a spectacular building. It's another architectural masterpiece for Trent. I do want to note that it has been the result of the work and commitment of many, many people. And I'd note in particular with our graduates, in particular, the commitment of Trent students who will realize their desire for a whole lot of things, which include a centralized hub for services, a better home for the Trent Central Student Association, space for student clubs and groups, Starbucks, and, and the students and the VP of Finance all insisted that it had to be Starbucks, and space for student life, career development, and student wellness uh, for all future Trent students. Now, I may get in trouble for what I'm going to do next, and I don't want to uh, embarrass anyone, but we have one student in particular here that I would like to recognize, and that is Elaine Spiewak, the president of the Trent Student uh, Association. <laughs> Elaine, where are you? Don't hide, there we go. <laughs> Thank you for all your work on the Student Center. A couple other highlights I'd note very quickly. One, uh, the formation of the Trent School of the Environment, which happened earlier this year. For 50 years, Trent has been a trailblazer in environmental research and teaching, being one of the first Canadian universities to establish programs in environmental studies. This year, this has culminated in the launch of the University School of the Environment. Secondly, this was just approved at the last Senate meeting and will be approved at the final board meeting of the year. I want to note the establishment of the Cheney Wenjack School for Indigenous Studies. Trent's groundbreaking leadership in Indigenous Studies dates back to our beginnings. We were the first university in Canada to establish an undergraduate program and then the first university to establish a PhD program in Indigenous Studies. In close collaboration with Indigenous elders, 
traditional knowledge holders in indigenous communities, the school will promote research and transmit indigenous knowledges in both its historical and contemporary forms at Trent and in local, national, and global communities. In 